very moment to, to meet your need, to allow for His Spirit to, to touch you wherever you are this morning. And I'm so encouraged and so thankful for the presence of the Lord. Just the opportunity we have as a family to join together, to pray for one another and to encourage one another. I'm thankful that we have the opportunity to take up God's word and to hear what he has for us, to proclaim the truth of his message, to understand that there is power in the word of God. So if you have your Bibles this morning, I would encourage you to, to turn with me to the book of Luke. Luke chapter 7, if you, if you don't have a Bible, reach under one of the chairs in front of you, take out a Bible, and you can use that this morning. If you don't have a Bible to call your own, please go ahead and just take that Bible with you today. It's a gift from us to you that you can get into God's Word, that you can understand and know who He is in your heart and in your life. But we need to understand that God's Word has been given to us to lead us, to guide us, and to direct us. Father, I thank you for your word, and I just pray now, Lord, that you'd speak to us through your word. Lord, I pray that as we come to this passage of Scripture in Luke chapter 7, Lord, it's a devastating Scripture, and Lord, I pray that you would devastate us this morning. Lord, I pray that as we come to the end of this passage this morning, that we would see that it is a joyful Scripture, and Lord, that you would bring joy to our hearts today. For Lord, that we would see in the midst of trial, in the midst of tribulation, Lord, we can look to you and Lord, that you would reach down and you would touch us and you would turn our circumstances from mourning into laughter. So Father, we pray you have your way. Speak, let your anointing rest upon your word and your servant today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Today I want us to look at this story of a dead man. The story about a dead man. Let me ask you this question this morning. Do you remember the first funeral that you ever attended? How many of you remember the first funeral that you ever went to? Maybe it was as a child or maybe later on in life. Do you remember the first person that you went and attended their funeral? The first time you looked into that casket or the first time you went to a funeral service? I still can remember the first funeral that I went to. It was my grandpa Jirasi, and I was nine years old, and my grandpa Jirasi had passed away up in New York. And I can remember that when the news came to my mom that he had passed away, I remember that it devastated me. At nine years old, it, it totally broke my heart. I remember my grandpa Jirasi, and the things I remember about him at the age of nine was, man, he, he would really freak me out. He had a wooden leg. And the freakiest thing was he would take the leg off. But the freakier thing was how he would put it back on. <laughs> but I can remember sitting in his house at the night, during the night and during the evening, and he, he would take it off before he'd go to bed, and I'd just be sitting there in amazement and just going, ooh, that's so weird. How can this happen? But I remember that. I'll never forget when I, when I turned eight years old, my grandpa Jirasi, he, he was kind of a recluse kind of a guy. He didn't go out much, but man, he, was a, he had a kind heart. He was a very loving man. And I can never, I'll never forget, we'd spend a week or 10 days up there every summer in New York. And I'll never forget when I was eight years old, Grandpa Jirasi said, hey, Wayne, I got something for you to do. And I'm like, okay, what is it? And he said, come on outside with me. We went outside and they had a pretty sizable backyard. And he said, I want to teach you. How to ride the tractor and mow the yard. Whoo, baby, eight years old, <laughs> getting on a tractor, riding around, cutting the grass. Man, I was so excited. And he walked me through all the steps on how to start it, how to move the clutch, how to put the blade down. And he said, okay, I I'm going I'm to ride around with you the first couple of times, but after that, you're on your own. I thought, man, this is going to be great. And he set me off. And as I'm going around the yard... Literally, around the yard, in circles. He, he comes down, he says, hey, stop, stop. You're not getting anywhere, just going in a circle. He, and he began to show me how to go back and forth, how to make the turns the right way. But I'll never forget, a couple of swipes after cutting the grass, I looked up, and there's my Grandpa Drossy, just sitting back, relaxing with a nice tea. 
And it wasn't until later on in life that I realized, man, he didn't want to teach me how to cut the grass for my sake. He wanted me to learn how to cut the grass so he could have a break from doing it. But I love my grandpa, Jirasi. I loved him so much, and, and, and I'll never forget that going over to his house, he had one prized possession. That prized possession was his pool table. This pool table took up the entire garage. This pool table had probably a more expensive covering over it than the table cost itself. And I'll never forget, man, as kids, we were not allowed to touch that pool table. We would try and sneak in, but somehow he'd always hear us sneaking into that room. But I'll never forget the day he said, Wayne, come on in. Let me teach you how to play pool. And he pulled the cover off, and it was the first time I ever saw the pool table with the cover off. And it's like, wow, this is amazing. And he handed me a stick, and he began to teach me, and he began to just interact in my life. So I had a good, close relationship for as close as we could be, being so many miles apart. But when the news came that Grandpa Jirasi had passed away, it devastated me as a nine-year-old. It broke my heart. I couldn't understand. Why is he dead? Why is he gone? What are we going to do now when we go back to, to visit grandpa and grandma? What are we going to do? It's not going to be the same. I can still, even to this day, I can still smell Grandpa Jirasi, man. He, he wore that, that Avon cologne that came in the, you know, the fancy car bottles. And, you know, he had some that looked like pipes. I think it was called Wild Country. I, I think that's the scent that he wore. And I can still picture that because... There was a closeness, there was a relationship that was there. And in all of our lives, we develop those relationships, we develop those close, uh, intertwined relationships, and that if something happens to that person, God forbid that it would be death that would take him, it wrecks our lives, it destroys our lives, it takes us to a point that we don't know what to do, that sometimes we become blubbering idiots, that we just cry over ourselves, we weep and we mourn, and we don't even understand what we're mourning for. I can remember going to the funeral not knowing what, what death would actually look like. I've never seen it before. And I remember walking up to the casket for the first time and seeing my grandpa laying there and just thinking, oh, he's, he's just asleep. And then as my mom began to explain that he wasn't coming back, it was so strange. It was defeating because here was this man that took the time to teach me how to drive the tractor, taught me how to play pole. There was this man that would embrace me and I, I could smell that cologne. And it was a challenging time. At the age of nine years old, my little life was rocked. My little life was destroyed for a couple of weeks. I can remember still to this day, my mom just putting her arms around me and saying, it's going to be okay, it's going to be okay. But why death? Why is death so painful? Why is, why is death so hard for us to understand? Why is death even at times preceded by, by such hardship? Why is death preceded at times by suffering? The Bible tells us that it is appointed unto man once to die. So it shouldn't take us by surprise that every one of us are going to die at some point. Every one of our loved ones at some point are going to pass away. But yet the thought and the idea of death is still devastating. Most people don't like to think about it. Most people don't even like to prepare for death. If you don't have a will, I encourage you, get a will done. Make sure you have a will for your family because you want to make sure that things take place afterwards. If you don't have life insurance, get life insurance. It's important if you have a family that you have life insurance to care for them if something were to happen to you. But so many times we fail to prepare for death in the sense of knowing that death comes. And so when death takes place, it is never easy. It is so hard for us to get a grasp of. When death comes, it seems to be completely unexpected. When death comes, it seems to take us completely by surprise. Death is devastating. Death will mess you up in so many different ways. And when we think about it, we think, oh, why does God allow for death? But when you look back to the creation of the earth, when you look back to how God formed the earth, when God created everything, he created everything perfect. He created everything that he spoke into existence in a perfect manner. He never intended for there to be death. When God created everything, he created it perfect and never intended for there to be death. So why is there death? Death comes because each and every one of us are sinners. When sin entered into the world, the Bible says that death now took over. You see, sometimes we do stupid things. Sometimes we do foolish things. 
And when we do stupid and foolish things, what ends up happening? It ends up harming us. It ends up devastating us. It ends up bringing about circumstances that we didn't expect to happen in our lives. When those circumstances happen and when, when they don't go the way we thought they would, what do we do typically? We typically get angry. We get mad. We get angry at God. God, why did you let this happen? Why is this going on in my life? Instead of looking back and saying, I brought this on as a result of my sin, we get angry with God. And God is saying, stop getting angry with me. It's a result of sin in your life. It's a result of sin in this world. But God's not the one that created death. This morning as we look into God's word, we're going to meet a woman who's at a funeral this morning, I want you just to, to emotionally connect with this woman. I want you to connect with her as she's going through this time of a, a funeral service. As she's going through a time of burying her one and only son. As you look at this passage, you can see that this pretty much has to be the worst day of her life. The worst day of her life, the day that her son died, became the day that her world was rocked. If you're a human this morning, I think that each and every one of us are We're going to have days just like this woman did. We're going to have times in our life where we're absolutely a mess, where we're absolutely brought to ruin, and we sit there and we wonder, why is this happening? God, what is taking place here? I can't go on. There is no more hope. Why even bother going on with my life? But I want you to see that in the midst of it, God is there. Some of you may be there this morning. Your life might be devastated because of something that's happening in your family, something that you're going through personally, and you're wondering, God, why is this taking place in me this morning? You're questioning why this sickness, why this death, why is it happening? Let me tell you, as a pastor, I could have never imagined the hardship, the challenges, the difficulties of going through and being a pastor and helping those that are in these times of need. They never teach us in Bible college about the devastation that takes place within the family of God. They never teach us about how to get through those things. You see, when I signed up to be a pastor, I thought, man, what can be better? Telling people, preaching the word of God, going out, seeing people saved, and coming to know Jesus Christ as their Savior and going out. They didn't teach me about the the hardships, the difficult times that each and every one of us face. Those challenging times. And that's why we need the Holy Spirit to see us through, to get us through from the dark side to the place where Jesus Christ can reach in and touch us. How do you cope? How do you deal with these things? How do you console people in the midst of their darkest moments? Stuff that we don't learn, it's not something that we're taught. Let me share with you a story one pastor writes about his first ever hospital visit. First ever hospital visit outside of going and congratulating a couple for having a baby. He says, I got a call from a young man in the congregation. He was a newer Christian. He came from a rough background. He had no living family except for his mother. He said, Pastor Mark, I need you to come to the hospital. It's an emergency. I got in my car and went downtown very late at night, and I met him in the waiting room. I said, okay, what's the situation? He said, well, you know my story. I'm a new Christian from a non-Christian family. My mom is my only living relative. She went to the Seattle area park, doused herself in gasoline in her car, and set herself on fire. Now she's brain dead. Her entire body's burned up, but they've got her her heart beating on a ventilator. What do I do? She's not a Christian. She doesn't love Jesus. If they pull the plug, she dies and goes to hell. She's my only relative. Pastor, what do I do? Pastor Mark says, I remember just sitting there thinking, I'm not ready for this. This man deserves far more than I'm able to give him at this point. See, as a pastor, I can relate to where he's coming from. Over the years, just continually being broken down in my own life, being broken in my own spirit, and having my heart broken for the the, the situations that many of you go through, the things that many of you face. And sitting there saying, Lord, what do I do? What do I say? How do I reach in and, and bring comfort in this time? See, I love the stories of hope. I love the stories of joy that we find in God's word. But I do believe that there is a time that we pick up God's word and we have to understand that there is times of joy, there is times of happiness, but they only come mostly when we go through the valley of the shadow of death. 
You see, it's only when we go through the valley of the shadow of death that we can see that God has been there with us, that we can see that God has said, I will never leave you, I won't forsake you. Oh, it's tough right now. Oh, it's devastating what you're going through. But trust in me, put your hope in me, I'll see you through. And when you get through, you'll be able to look back and say, wow, if it wasn't for you, God, I wouldn't be here. If it wasn't for you in my life, I wouldn't have made it through this situation. As your pastor, I'm not immune to the suffering and the pain and the hurt that takes place in people's lives, to the pain and the suffering that even takes place in my own life from time to time. You see, I'm human, and each and every one of us are, and we all have struggles, we all have hurts, we all have pain that we go through. Believe it or not, your pastor suffers with with times of saying, Lord, are you really there? What are you doing? There's times when my faith becomes weak, but it's like I cry out, Lord, in my weakness, Lord, in my weakness, in my faith, when it's weak, Lord, I still believe. Lord, increase my faith. And that's what we have to recognize here, that in our weakest, in our lowest point, God comes along and says, I'm going to increase your faith. See, I struggle in my faith as I see some of my pastor's friends going through struggles. Pastor Walt Smith, pastor over at Abundant Life Assembly, over on 4th Street in Altoona. I struggle in my faith to see his wife just being devastated by sickness, week after week after week. I struggle in my faith as I see a church family over there just laying their hands upon her, praying and believing, saying, Lord, provide a miracle. Do something great in their life. Week after week, seeing Pastor Walt just saying, I believe I'm trusting the Lord. We don't know what's happening, but we're going to believe God for a miracle. And yet still hearing that she's not fully recovering, hearing that she has strokes week after week after week. And I struggle and say, Lord, what are you doing? What's the situation? I struggle in my faith when I think about a, another pastor friend, Kurt Nagel, and his daughter, Michaela. She has neurofibromatosis. She's been in chemotherapy for seven years of her 14 years of life. In 2012, she had brain surgery. If she hadn't had the brain surgery, they said she would have died in two months. And I sit there and say, God, where are you in this situation? What are you doing? How is it, how is it that you put this upon people? shared earlier this past week, I got calls from, from so many different people that are in the hospital. Tony, Joanne, Marianne, and Stephanie, and even some others that went in for surgeries. You see, the Bible tells us that there are going to be times when our lives are broken and damaged. There's going to be times when your life is destroyed. And let me tell you this. The more people you love, the more people you know, the more people you get involved with, the more people you're going to go through times of devastation with. Because you see, that's what the Bible tells us. It says sin leads to death. It leads to destruction. Not that we're all sinners and we're going around saying, oh, it's because of sin in my life that these things are happening. But it's because sin in the world just destroys. But it's in those times that we say, Lord, when I'm going through this, or as so-and-so, my friend is going through this, Lord, I want to be there for them. I want to be there to encourage them. I want to be there to lift them up in this situation. As we look at this passage today, I want you to emotionally connect with me so that we can really appreciate this amazing woman. The first thing I want us to see from this passage today is that Jesus seeks out broken people. Jesus is seeking out those that are broken this morning. That's just what Jesus does. That's a part of his nature and his character. That is our Jesus this morning. God comes to earth as the man Jesus Christ, and he is going out looking for absolutely messed up, destroyed, broken lives, people that are having the worst day of their life. Jesus sets out to find them. Luke chapter 7, beginning with verse number 11. It says, Soon afterward, Jesus went to a town called Nain, and his disciples in a large crowd went along with him. As he approached the town gate, a dead person was being carried out. Feel that for just a minute. As he approached the town, a dead person was being carried out. Go there. Just like you're going to that funeral. Think about those times. Goes on to say, the only son of his mother, and she was a widow. A large crowd from the town was with her. When the Lord saw her, his heart went out to her, and he said, don't cry. Friends, this is a devastating day 
This is a crushing situation. It is one of a broken and a destroyed woman. The Bible says that she's in a town called Nain. This town doesn't even appear in any other parts of the Bible. This is the only mention of this town. The town is very unimportant. It's nowhere. It's basically 20 miles between, uh, to Capernaum and six miles to Nazareth. If you know the story, the Bible tells us that Nazareth itself was a no-name town, that nothing good ever came out of Nazareth. This is a small little village. This woman's probably poor because everyone who lives there is poor. She probably, lit- she probably literally can't even read the scriptures. In the, in the day and age, it was it almost hardly found that a woman was able to be literate. But what does the Bible tell us about her? Well, the Bible tells us she's already been to one funeral. She's been to her husband's funeral. The Bible says she buried her husband. Ladies, think about that for a moment. The Bible gives particular affection to widows and orphans. But I want you to think this morning. Ladies, I don't know what's going on with your husband. I don't know what you're fighting about, what you're bitter about, what you're nagging him about. But let me encourage you to take care of it today because you don't want to be in a place of burying him having any regrets. Husband, the same is true for you. It doesn't matter what you're going through in your life, in your family, with your spouse. Take care of it. Because you don't want to bury him having any regrets. The Bible says that she buried her husband, and now what's happening is she's burying her son. Not just any son, but the Bible says it's her one and her only son. The loss of her only son meant a miserable future for her. You see, he would be responsible for taking care of his mother. She wouldn't be able to do it on her own. They didn't have social security back in those days. She wasn't getting any government check because he had passed away. And so her son would have been responsible for providing for her, for meeting her needs, for taking care of her. This woman is absolutely at the end of a rope. At one point, she may have had a great life, a husband and a son. Things were going really well, just like some of us today. Things are going really well. But then all of a sudden, just like that, it changed. The Bible says that she buried her husband, and now she's on her way to bury her son. I don't know if there's anything more devastating than a parent burying a child. Sadly, I've had to do funerals for parents that have lost children. Friends, let me tell you, it is the most devastating, it is the hardest thing as a pastor to do to perform a funeral service for a child. It's not right that a child should precede their parent in death, and yet the Bible tells us that, that death comes to all, and we don't understand it, we can't grasp it, but it's still so heart-wrenching. It breaks our heart. This woman's life is devastated. And what we see is that Jesus comes to her. In her devastation, the Bible tells us that Jesus walks into this town. He walks up to this woman, and he simply says, don't cry. It's amazing what we don't see here. We don't see this woman going out and seeking after Jesus. We don't see her putting everything aside and saying, I have to find Jesus. I have to find this man that I've heard about. I need to go to where he is, because maybe he can do something different in my life. The Bible says that Jesus comes to her. But even more impressive is that Jesus not only comes to her, but he goes out of his way to get to her. The Bible tells us that Jesus will probably walk a few days or at least a full day over hilly terrain. The crowds, the Bible says, are pressing in. They're pulling at him. The multitudes are pursuing him. They want him to stop. They want Jesus to take the time to answer their questions. They want him to pray for them. They want him to to stop and plant a church in their town. They want him to teach a Bible study. They want Jesus to meet their needs. They want Jesus to cast the demons out in their town. They want him to heal their illnesses. And yet Jesus says, I have a mission. I need to get to name. And so even with everybody pressing in around him, trying to stop him, he pursues this woman. For a reason that Luke doesn't know, Jesus is going to this little town of Nain. Why would Jesus waste his time in such a small town? Why would he waste his time going to this little town to see this widow? Jesus headed to Nain because he needed to get to her. The Bible says as he enters the town, the entire village is probably out there In those days, being such a small town, everybody would have known this woman, they would have known this young man, and they would have come out to mourn as the procession went down the streets. 
In that day and age, they would have professional wailers that they would hire to come out, and all they would do is wail and cry the entire funeral procession. Flute players would have been playing a loud community-wide event was taking place. Everyone's weeping. Everyone's crying. This young man's friends are weeping and crying. All the families that know him are crying. They're embracing one another. They're embracing this woman because her life is a mess. The second funeral they've attended with her. How can she go on? How can this woman keep going? Everybody's crying. Everybody's weeping. The entire town is mourning. And then Jesus. And then Jesus. And then Jesus steps into that town. And all of a sudden when Jesus steps into the situation, it goes from mourning and weeping and crying to all of a sudden Jesus says, don't cry. What do you mean don't cry? How is it possible for me not to cry? Don't you see what's taking place here? But Jesus steps in, and this is exactly how Jesus works. You see, church, Jesus comes to people who don't ask for him. Jesus will come to those who don't even seek him out. He'll comfort those that do not seek him. He goes out of his way to pursue people who aren't even aware of him. Why? Because that's our Jesus. That's what he does. Our Jesus is not only seeking out messed up people, but he has the ability to find those whose lives are ruined. He's not like you and I when it comes to playing the game of hide and seek. You know the game of hide and seek? Everybody goes out to hide and you're counting one, two, three to a hundred or whatever. And then all of a sudden you're set out to find them. Where could they possibly be? Where are they hiding? You know the first one that's usually found is the one that can't keep still or can't keep quiet. (laughs) They're always giggling or moving around. It's the, it's the one that the dog follows, you know? And it's like, I know where that kid is. But as the seeker, we go from here to there trying to find the person. But the Bible says that Jesus had a purpose. He knew where this woman was. He knew her situation. And he set out, even though the crowds were pressing in, he had a direct line to the city of Nain and to this woman. That's the way our God works. He is seeking us out and he will find us. He knows exactly where you and I are hiding. He knows precisely when to show up. Understand this. He's not only seeking up, but knows exactly when to show up. Oh, we want him to show up on our time schedule sometimes, don't we? Well, we want him to show up on our time schedule all the time. (laughs) But God knows when it's appropriate. Some of you may be here today and you're absolutely devastated. And Jesus is saying, I knew you were going to be here today. I knew you were going to be here. That's why I showed up for you. I knew you were going to be here. That's why we allowed the Holy Spirit to move so that you could come to this altar to be prayed for. I knew you were going to be here today. That's why I allowed for the Spirit to speak to you through the voice, tongues, and interpretation. I knew you were going to be here. That's why I showed up this morning. See, it's not by mistake that you're here today. It's not by circumstance. It is a divine appointment that Jesus himself has directed. He wanted you here so that he could move in your heart and in your life today. Some of you may be here this morning, you know people who are absolutely destroyed or devastated in their lives. You need to know that Jesus can and does pursue them. Jesus is going after them. He's reaching out to them. Jesus reaches out to shattered people. Because of what he does. How many of us, when we find out that someone's really suffering, really hurting, it's a challenge for us. We don't even know what to do sometimes. We don't even know what to say. It gets messy. Destruction, devastation, hurt. It's a messy thing. But you see, when we go out in the name of Jesus, when Jesus goes along with us, it is him that provides the miracle. When Jesus finds this woman, he doesn't just stand there. Jesus shows up with a miracle in hand. It amazes me at funerals. You go into a funeral and you stand there and you watch at times and you can always tell those that were really close to the person that passed away. Oftentimes they'll walk up to the casket and they'll just reach over and they'll they'll touch that person by the hand. Sometimes they'll reach over and just give a little kiss on the forehead and you can tell that they were close to this person, that it wasn't just an acquaintance. Because those that were just an acquaintance, they'll come in and they'll stand there and they'll look and say, oh, he looks good. And they'll continue on. But you see, those that had a deeper relationship, they'll take the time and they'll reach in. They'll take the time to have touch. 
There's something said about human touch. Human touch can stir up all kinds of emotions within us. Human touch can bring us out of a doldrum and lift our spirits up. But friends, let me tell you, there is nothing like the supernatural touch of Jesus Christ. You see, when Jesus Christ comes along, the Bible says that he reaches down to where this woman is, and he touches her. He touches her. Look at verses 14 through 15. It says he went up and touched the bearer and those that were carrying him on. The bearer stood still. He said, young man, I say to you, get up. The dead man sat up and began to talk. And Jesus gave him back to his mother. The second thing I want you to see here this morning is that Jesus touches dead people and he brings life. Jesus touches dead people and he brings about life. Jesus reaches into the depth of our heart and the depth of our soul that is dying and he says, I want you to experience life. The religious people at the time would tell you that Jesus shouldn't do this. He should never touch a dead person. They would say that that dead body is unclean. It's defiled and no one should touch it. You're not supposed to reach into the casket. You're not supposed to touch a dead body. It's ceremonially unclean. It's something you shouldn't do. It'll defile you, but it doesn't stop Jesus. It doesn't stop him. He walks right up to the body, and he reaches into the casket. The Bible says the bearers stopped and stood still. Everybody was in shock that this man would come up and reach in and touch this dead body. What is he doing? Doesn't he know that he can't touch this body? Doesn't he know that he'd be unclean himself, that he'd be considered dead as well because he did this? But you see, that's just it. With Christ, there is no death. With Christ, there is no death. With him, there is only life. Jesus reaches into death, and he touches this young man, and he gives him a one-word command. He says, arise. Arise. Get up. Jesus looks into death. He stares death in the face. He reaches in and touches death, and he says, arise. Get up out of your death. Young man, I say to you, arise. And what happens is the Bible says the dead man, all of a sudden, this dead man, Luke is writing this story. Luke's a physician. The the clinical term here is that he's dead, completely dead. There's no hope for him. The Bible says that Luke says all of a sudden he sat up and he began to speak. Freaky. (laughs) He sat up. And began to speak. We don't know how long he's been dead for. He's been dead for quite some time, probably. That's why they're having the funeral service. But this dead man sits up and he begins to speak. Can you imagine the emotional transition at that very moment? The emotions going from weeping and crying and wailing to all of a sudden, what takes place here? All of a sudden, their lives, their countenance begins to change. The man sits up. He starts talking. The Bible says he gets out of the coffin. Jesus takes him and he escorts him over to his mother. Just just picture her face for a moment. Picture this woman's face. The tears are flowing, but now all of a sudden, they're not tears of sorrow, they're tears of joy. How long do you think she held on to her son? When Jesus brought her over, I guarantee you she was running towards him. (laughs) How long did she hold on? How long did she embrace him? How long did she say, oh, I've been waiting, I've been waiting, I can't believe this has taken place. I guarantee you she was jumping up and down, screaming for joy. Other people were saying, wow, this is a miracle. Why? Because she got her son back. She received her son back. He was dead, but now he's alive. Her son is alive and well. He's restored to hell. Why? Because that's what our Jesus does. That's what he does. He touches dead people and he brings life. He has reached into your heart, into your soul, and he says, I want to bring you life this morning. Jesus does it for each and every one of us. First, to make us Christians. It's actually a powerful analogy for salvation that we find in this passage in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4 4 and 5. It says, God being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. Even while we were dead in our sin and trespasses, Christ stepped in and he has made us alive together with Christ. Church, because we're sinners, though physically we're alive, we're still spiritually dead. We're spiritually in the same place that this young man was. We were dead. We were dead to God. 
We don't seek God. The Bible says that no one seeks God. We don't find God. This man wasn't crying out for help. It's interesting here. This man is dead. This man's not crying out for help. He can't. He's dead. He's not seeking Jesus. He's not running to Capernaum to find Jesus, to get healing. This man is completely dead. This man does nothing. He says nothing. He seeks nothing. And yet Jesus finds him. In the midst of his death, Jesus finds him. That is our Jesus. He will seek out those that are lost. This man doesn't reach out to Jesus. Jesus reaches out to him. He doesn't participate. This young man doesn't participate in his own resurrection. He's dead. He's not doing anything. But what happens is he receives the gift that Jesus brings. He receives the gift of life when Jesus reaches in touches him, and says, arise. Church, that's exactly how salvation works. You and I were dead in our sin, completely and totally dead. But in the middle of our sin, Jesus found us. Jesus reached out to you this morning. Jesus reached out and he touched you. In the middle of your sin, Jesus came along and said, I want to give you spiritual life. And he steps in and he takes that old, crusty, dirty, filthy, disgusting heart and he says, I'm going to give you a new heart. I'm going to give you a new nature. I'm going to give you a new power, a power of the Holy Spirit. See, any of us that are Christians, we've experienced this in our life. I remember experiencing it when I was five years of age, kneeling at my couch and my dad just praying with me and recognizing that I was going from spiritual death to spiritual life. I didn't do anything. Jesus did it all. All I did was simply say, Lord, I accept, I receive. And he spoke into my life, and he changed my life that day. Jesus reaches into this casket, and it doesn't make him unclean, because he's perfect, he's holy, he is God. And the Bible says that Jesus was without sin, so it wasn't that he reached in, all of a sudden sin came upon him. We see when he touched the man, he wasn't made unclean, but instead this man was made clean because Jesus was perfect. Jesus didn't receive the death, he gives life. That's how it works. He gives life. If you're a Christian, you've experienced this. If you're not a believer this morning in Christ today, and you're wondering, how in the world do I get connected? How in the world do, do, I, do I have a relationship with God? How in the world do I find that my life goes from death into life? It's simple. It's through receiving the touch of Jesus Christ, God's only Son. It's awesome to know that Jesus actually does heal those who are sick. It's awesome to know that as we go through the Gospels, we see over and over and over that Jesus heals those that are sick in body. Why do we still believe it? Why do we still pray for it? Because the Bible says that it is still something that God is doing, that he is still reaching out, that he's still touching, that we pray the prayer of faith, that people will be healed and that their lives will change. It's awesome to know that Jesus heals the sick. Does everyone get healed? I'm going to say no, but I'm going to say no because it's not in the way that we expect them to get healed. See, when God says that when we pray, he answers our prayers, I believe it to be 100% true. The problem is, is that he doesn't always answer them the exact way we think they should be answered. So he heals, but maybe not the way we expect healing to take place. Does he heal some the way we expect? Yes, he does. (laughs) The miraculous testimonies we hear are amazing. To this day, our Jesus can and does still heal, and so we pray. We still ask him. Sometimes, yes, our Jesus actually raises up even a dead body to life. He revives a physical dead body. It's not necessarily a resurrection because the Bible tells us that it's only on that day when the trumpet of the Lord shall sound that the dead in Christ will rise. That's our resurrection. If a dead body rises, it's not a resurrection. It's a resuscitation, basically. And he does that. God still heals. Reinhard Bonnke has an incredible ministry. And he himself has experienced people coming back to life. I've heard of other evangelists, other pastors that have prayed and seen people come back to life. It's amazing what God can still do. But God ultimately wants to revive our spiritual life, our spiritually dead life. He wants to come in and he wants to revive us. He wants to bring it back to life. According to the New Testament, we find that Jesus brings back three people from death. Lazarus, who is Jesus' friend. We find that he brings back Jairus, the daughter, the young daughter of an important person, and here the widow's son. It's not an often occurrence. It's a rare occurrence, actually. 
but it's showing us the power of Jesus over death. It's showing us the kingdom of God and how things will ultimately be in the very end. You see, church, one day we will all rise. Just as Jesus spoke to that young man, arise, get up. One day, Jesus will speak to each and every one of us, and then he'll say, rise. Rise to your home. Rise to your rest. We will rise just as this man rose. We'll finally discover that death, that death is, that enemy can no longer defeat us. We'll find that death was so unnatural because Christ desired for life to be there, that death is only the result of rebellion of sin, and that Jesus Christ is the one who came to conquer death, hell, and the grave. And when Jesus says, arise, we will rise up to meet him in the air and will be changed in the twinkling of an eye. John chapter 5, verse 28 says, An hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out, those who have done good to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. How do we get to the resurrection life? By knowing Jesus Christ, by receiving that touch that he offers and saying, Lord, I accept you as my Lord and Savior. And we receive our reward, which is eternity with him in heaven. What does it say? If we don't do that, it says that there is a time when evil will be found out and you will go to that place, that evil of resurrection, to the place of judgment. The Bible is very clear that that judgment is eternity in hell. Friends, there is no if, ands, or buts. There's no in between. It's heaven or hell. Jesus is the way to heaven. He's the only way to heaven. Jesus is the only way to escape hell. People think, well, I can get by. I'm just going to be a good person. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. And it'll get me to heaven. No, Jesus is the only one that can reach down and touch you and change your life. It's heaven to gain. It's heaven to gain and hell to lose. Have you accepted Jesus Christ? Jesus says everyone who dies will rise and they will stand before God the Father. Jesus will be there to give an account on our behalf. In other words, he will be the only witness called to testify for or against us. We'll not be our own judge and jury. As your pastor, I won't be there to stand before God saying, well, they did a good job of attending church. Oh, I think they gave their tithes. Oh, you know, they did this at the church. I won't be there. There is only one that will be able to stand there and give an account for your life, and that is Jesus Christ, the one who holds life and death in his hands. Jesus says that all who die will rise and stand before him. Those who belong to him and live with him will receive eternal life. Those who don't belong to him and don't live him, with him will receive eternal death, damnation, and condemnation. So what exactly is Jesus doing here? In addition to loving the widow and raising the son, he is also unveiling the kingdom of heaven. You see, church, our Jesus is a king, and he's bringing his kingdom. And you and I one day will rise. The resurrection of this young man is a revelation of this kingdom. It is a foreshadowing, it's a glimpse into what God intends for us to see in the end of the age. There's actually an ancient historical record that was sent to Emperor Hardian about 100 years after this miracle that basically says, yes, Jesus healed people. He rose a few from the dead. Many of them lived a long time, and some of them are still alive, and we've actually talked to them. See, what Jesus does is confirmed. Finally, this morning, I want you to see that Jesus is a greater risen son. Ask any mother here this morning, and they'll tell you that their son is the best. Their son's the best. No one compares to their boy. My boy is the best. In Matthew chapter 20, James and John's mom pleads with Jesus to to allow for their sons to sit at his right hand in heaven. Oh, come on, Jesus, my boys are the best. They deserve to sit beside you in heaven. Think about it, moms. How many of you, when your son's gotten into trouble, your first reply is, oh, it couldn't be. Not my son. Oh, he's a good boy. He would never do anything like that. We all think that our boys are perfect. But this passage tells us that there is only one who is perfect. Look as we conclude with verse 16 and 17. It says, They were all filled with awe and praise God. A great prophet has appeared among us, they said. God has come to help his people. This news about Jesus spread throughout Judea and the surrounding country. I love the first response of everyone there. The Bible says they all stop. They're weeping. And their weeping turns to worship. They stop their weeping and their crying and they begin to worship. They're amazed, they're in awe that this Jesus had the authority, the power over death. And so they worshiped him. 
Their first response was to worship. Church, that has to be our first response as well. We need to respond today by worshiping this living God, this living King, Jesus Christ. They immediately went from worshiping, the Bible says, to spreading the news. They began to evangelize. People went to work. They went to school. They they went back home. They went about their daily routines as missionaries for Jesus Christ. They didn't keep what they saw to themselves, but they began to share it with everybody else. You're not going to believe this past week I was at a funeral, and we're all crying. We're all weeping, and we're just going through, and all of a sudden this man shows up, and he reaches into the coffin, and he touches this boy, and he gets up, and he starts talking. He runs to his mom. Oh, you're not going to believe this man. His name is Jesus. Have you heard about him? You haven't? Well, let me tell you about him. (laughs) They were excited because Jesus not only touched this boy's life, he not only touched this woman's life, but he touched everyone else that was around that day. Friends, why do we keep it such a secret? Why do we keep it to ourselves? Jesus says we need to worship him, and then we need to go out and evangelize about him. Let other people know. You see, the right response to the person and the work of Jesus is worship and mission. Our response to him is, Lord, I'm going to worship you, and I'm going to go out and serve you. Jesus is not only a greater son, he is the one and the only son of God. Look at the parallels. Jesus comes as the only begotten son of God, the father. He's dearly loved as this son was. He's a one of a kind son. He's the son of God. This son was the only son of this woman. Father loved the son. We read earlier in Luke that at Jesus' baptism, the God the father says, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Here it's obvious that the mother loved her son. Just as this son died, so Jesus, the greater son, died. He died not for any sin that he committed, but he died in our place for your sin and for my sin. Just as this young man rose from death, so Jesus, as a young man, has rose from death. But the resurrection wasn't for himself. Jesus didn't rise from the dead for himself. He rose from the dead to conquer death for all of God's children, for all those that would believe, for all those who would receive. You see, church, Jesus is the greater son. If you're suffering today, if your life is damaged, if you're going through a time and you feel destroyed, those around you are walking in times of suffering and dying, you need to know this morning that we have a sympathetic high priest and his name is Jesus. We have one that's been there. We have one that's tasted the full sting of the consequences of death. Church, our God is not immune to suffering. Our God's not indifferent towards suffering. He's not negligent towards suffering. Our God, Jesus, is the greater son. He's absolutely, unequivocally, fully, thoroughly, completely knows exactly what it's like to suffer and to die. And he does so for you and for me and to cleanse us from our sin. And he does so, why? Because he loved us so much. God loved you so much that he sent his son. For those of us who have buried someone that we love, I want you to know this morning that God the Father is one who fully identifies. The Father, the Bible tells us, was present at the death of his son. The worst atrocity, humanly speaking, it was the greatest injustice that it was ever carried out. Sinners murdered the Son of God. And the Bible says that the Father was there and he felt it all. For those of you that are suffering, your life is all of a sudden come to a crashing halt. Maybe the world seems like it's crashing all around you. Your life is one that is crushed. I want you to remember Jesus this morning, the greater Son. I want you to go to him this morning for comfort, for love. Recognize that you can go to him for support and understanding and encouragement. This woman wasn't alone. One of the most important aspects of the Christian faith is that we need to be in community with other people. We need the encouragement from one another when we go through these times. Last night at our men's ministry, we, we had a great time of just fellowshipping and getting to know each other and, and, and just laughing and, and, and just discussing the things of God and, and just developing that community, that relationship with each other. You see, it's only in that community and that relationship that we grow stronger together and we can see each other through these times. This widow had an entire community come around her in a moment of suffering. Friends, we need to be a part of that as well. We need to be an active part of the body of Christ, an active part of the church. We need to be connected with God's people. We need other people to rally around us in our times of suffering. And we only do that when we get connected. When God was done with the creation of the world, he said everything is very good. God's not a sinner, we are. God brought life. We brought death. God is always faithful to us, but we can be unfaithful to him. 
when we suffer, we see others suffering. To accuse God of evil is a terrible thing. Yes, I know we're in pain. I know we're frustrated. I know we struggle. I know we go through times of strife. We have questions. We have doubts. You know what? That's okay. You see, the Bible says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. We need to work these things out. But we don't worship a God who is immune to our suffering. Jesus suffered and died. We don't worship a God, the Father, who is indifferent toward our suffering. If you're hurting, he knows exactly what you're going through. Trust him. Stick with him. He'll see you through. God is calling us today to worship him, to evangelize, to spread the good news. You see, when we spread the good news of Jesus, dead people come to life. And he reunites them with those that love them. In his presence, there will be resurrection. There will be reconciliation. The Bible says that Jesus will wipe away every tear from our eyes and sin and death will be no more. He'll wipe away every tear and sin and death will be no more. It's a day that is coming. Church, we suffer and weep and mourn as this woman did. We cry as she did. We surround ourselves with the support of a church family like she did with the people of Nain. But it's by faith, trust that the resurrection is coming today. By faith, trust that that resurrection will happen. Trust today that Jesus will reach down into your dead body, reach down into that casket of death and say, today, arise. Today, get up. Today, I'm breathing life back into that dead body. Today, Lord, today, I choose to receive life over death. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning. Lord, I pray for each and every one of us as a people. Lord, this is a powerful verse, powerful passage of Scripture. Lord, it takes us from the depths of destruction to the, the hope and the joy of receiving life. And I pray this morning that your Holy Spirit will have worked in our lives in that sense. Recognizing that even though we're in the midst of, of destruction and despair, Lord, that you're there. Lord, help us to understand that it'll be fine, but only with you. I know right now, this morning, you might be in that place of a ruined life. Maybe you brought the, brought the destruction and ruin on yourself. You say, why would God care about me? Why would God want to give me life? I did this to myself. Remember, Jesus is pursuing. Jesus is coming after you. He's not sitting back waiting for you just to show up. He's here this morning. He has come here this morning to meet with you. He has come here this morning to reach into your life and to offer you a brand new start. The question is, will you reach out? Will you re reach out as he passes by? The Bible says it's appointed unto each man to die. We don't know the day. We don't know the hour. We can't put, we can't put a time on our death. And sadly, for so many, it takes us by surprise. Sadly, so many in this world, when death comes, they're miserable. They're, they're, they're just, their lives are wrecked and destroyed. They, don't, they can't figure it out, and they have no hope. They have no, no desire. And yet, for those that believe in Jesus Christ, when death comes, yes, it's hard. Yes, it's troubling. Yes, it breaks our heart. But yet, we know that as a believer, we are passing from physical life to an eternal spiritual life with God in eternity. We don't go from life to death. We go from life to greater life. We go from life to abundant life. We go from life to everlasting life. Have you allowed Jesus to touch you today? Have you allowed him to touch you?